one, hasn't it? We used to, we shared everything. Shared a room, shared the underwear drawer, so many different things we've shared. Shared the pool pits, shared journeys, shared missions, shared everything. It's just been amazing. I guess, you know, the, the, the little takeaway that I could leave you with, the fact that my bros here, is I know some of you, you're your children, you know, they left church, I don't know, maybe 10, 11, 12 years old, and like we did. We le- I left when I was 13, John left when I, you must have been about 11 and a half, I guess, and we just, the, the church service was so boring, or either that or we were so rebellious, but we just said to our mother, I'd, I'd rather take my chances with hell than endure another meeting like that. Um, thank God, God had mercy on us. Because uh, we both ended up pursuing the same things, pretty extreme, really. Uh, never forget the time that John rang Julie and I. He was ringing us from the Mount Cook National Park in New Zealand, and he was tied together with a, a climbing instructor. And uh, the climbing instructor had only taught John the day before how to do a prussic loop in the in the uh, the climbing rope, so that if you see your partner disappear under the snow in a crevasse, you get one go at. Of, of, getting your ice axe through that prussic loop. And uh, amazing, that's what exactly happened. The guy who was the instructor was walking up uh, a, a crevasse-laden glacier and disappeared through the snow. And John sees the, the, the line snaking out and he stuck that ice axe in the best of his ability and nailed it. <laughs> and the, guy, the guy is swinging in the crevasse like this and I don't know how he got out of it, but uh, I'll never forget that phone call. Events like that, those near-death experiences, you know, as a, if you're a backslidden Christian, you supply those, you survive those things. You know, that's the mercy of God. Yeah. Amen. It's the grace of God. And for all you mamas and papas who your kids have kind of disappeared out of church for years sometimes, you need to have faith. Keep believing. Because my mother never stopped praying. I think maybe sometimes she did. I think she need, if it was me, John, I would have given up on us. We were just so far gone, so feral, really. <laughs> but, you know, God raised up intercessors, my Aunt Jill and a few others. And then after, what, 12 years for me, same for you, God brought us back to himself and back in the church, not into the old church. My mother was upset about that. But back into a charismatic church where God was so real and there was a mission And it was everything that the spirit of adventure in us was born for, to follow Christ and fulfill the Great Commission. And I just want to encourage you parents that your your kids are not coming along for the ride right now. Keep praying. Pray every day. Because we ended up coming back to the Lord at the same time, ended up in the same church, and both were called into ministry. God did exceedingly abundantly above that which my mother could dare ask or think. And to God be the glory for that. Amen. So without any, I've already told them about you so many, many times, John. It's like, I, I can't add anything. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to say, here's my bro. Come up and preach your guts out. <laughs> hey, thanks, mate. God bless you. Wow. The journey of life, eh? Yeah. Where it takes us. You know, I was just reminiscing there at what Rob was saying. Hey, great to be here in Suncoast in Eastbourne. Hello, church. Yeah? Do you like my t-shirt? I brought the most anointed t-shirt I have. (laughs) Do you know, I was just sitting there listening to Rob and I thought, you know, God is just so amazing. You know, one years and years ago, there was one summer holiday. I took five weeks off work and with Julie's brother. I went to Nepal in the Himalayas and I trekked around the Annapurna range of the Himalayas. Um, David, Julie's brother, had twisted his ankle, so I left him behind. And um, <laughs> we met up weeks later, and man, I tell you what, we just, man, we blew our heads off with dope. We were wicked boys, wicked boys. But see, the next year, the next year or thereabouts, it wasn't going smoking dope. Do you know what it was? It was going to the beach with a bag load of theological books. <laughs> Such a radical conversion (laughs) because Jesus gets into your heart. Jesus gets into your heart. Hey, I would love a servant of God to get me some water. Is that all right? And 
What an awesome wedding yesterday. And Pastor Freddie, what a great wedding ceremony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, um, I should say that this message comes with a warning. <laughs> it could seriously enhance your spiritual health. <laughs> Do you know, I went, to, I went to my preaching vault. It's a preaching vault that's got 37 years of preaching and illustrations and stories. And I, I, I pieced together this message, right? And the title of my sermon is Called to Make a Difference. Called to Make a Difference. And I would like to read to you today from Ezekiel chapter 22. And we're going to read from verse 29. The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and the needy, and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Therefore I have poured out my indignation and anger on them, that is just wonderful. That's not in the scriptures, by the way, right? That's me. I've poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath, and I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, saith the Lord God. Do you know, just to put these verses in context, I want to read to you the first two verses of the same chapter, and I'll read these. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, now, son of man, will you judge? Will you judge the bloody city? Yes, show her, the city, all her abominations. Do you know, can I just point out at the start that God said to the prophet, go and show the bloody city. He did not say, go and show the beloved city. Go and show the city of the great king. Go and show the special city. God said, Ezekiel, go and show the bloody city the abominations and the corruption. Do you know, if you were to go through the whole chapter, that city was an absolute chaos and turmoil. It had sunk so low that God had said he was going to gather the people like metal workers gather gold and silver and tin and bronze and put it into a furnace. And the city was going to face the incredible judgment and anger of a holy God. I mean, if you go through, I mean, the, the message cheers up in a minute, all right? <laughs> if you were to go through the whole um, chapter, you'll read things like this. Corruption, bribery, murder, the oppression of the fatherless, the oppression of the widow. You'll read about adultery. It even goes as far to mention that there was incestuous relationships happening in the city. The whole chapter is one of corruption and wickedness and pure evil. It tells us in the chapter that the very priests, the men of God, could not distinguish between the holy and the unholy, the righteous and the unrighteous. And God said this, listen to it, check it out. God said, I sought for a man among them that would stand in the gap and build up the wall. And God said, but I couldn't find anyone. I could not find anyone. Therefore, the scripture says, I poured out judgment instead of mercy. The inference of the scripture is this, is that if God could have found one man, one solitary individual, mercy would have triumphed over judgment and judgment would have been averted and the people would have been saved. And you know, I don't see much difference between Ezekiel's day back then and, and Britain in the 21st century. There is oppression, there is mayhem, there is corruption, there is bribery. And God's saying, I'm looking for one man who will stand in the gap. I'm looking for one woman. I want to point out what it doesn't say. It does not say that God looked for a crowd. It does not say that God looked for a celebrity. It does not say that God looked for a good looking man. There's not even a qualifying statement in the verse. I looked for a man with education. It's not there. I looked for a man of wealth. It's not there. I looked for a man who was very good looking. It's not there. All it says is I looked for a man, one solitary individual. And I want to challenge us today that we are going to be those men and women. We are going to be the individuals that together we make a difference in our world. We make a difference in our schools. We make a difference in the office. We make a difference in our homes. We make a difference in our marriages. We are the difference makers because the difference maker lives in us. Uh. 
Do you know, if I'm really, I apologize to the Farsi people if I just go with the flow, I get in the groove and I'm off. I want to give you some examples from history. Um, there's a guy called John Geddes. He was a Scottish minister. He was born in Banff in Scotland. And he's known as the father of Presbyterianism in the South Seas of the Pacific. And on the islands of Vanuatu, I preached in Vanuatu in Solomon Islands 23 years ago. This is just a little side story. I actually killed a pig on the Solomon Islands one day. The mission fun. And anyway, John Geddes on the island of Vanuatu, there is a memorial built to his memory. And on that memorial are these words. When he came in 1848, there were no Christians. When he left in 1872, there were no heathen. <laughs> he was a difference maker. A difference maker. Friend, you are a difference maker because the difference maker lives in your heart. And I don't, well, we'll get to that in a minute. What about John Eglin? John Eglin woke up on a very, very cold January morning, Sunday in January 1850, and he pulled back the curtains, and all he could, he could see, for, as far as his eye could see, was snow, just a pure white blanket of snow, inches deep. And on that Sunday morning, his first thought was, no one will go to church today. And he thought, I'll go back to bed. But then he thought, I need to go to church because I'm a deacon in the church. And John Eglin put on his coat and his scarf and his hat. And listen, he walked six miles through the snow from his village to the small town of Colchester in England. And he went to his church, the Methodist church. And when he got in there, he, he noticed that the preacher wasn't there. And John Eglin had never preached a sermon in his life. He'd never been asked. He'd never needed to. And when he got into the church, there were 12 church members. And they had a discussion. We should go home, some of them said. And John Eglin said, no, I've come all this way. You've come all this way. We're going to lift up Jesus Christ. And John Eglin got into the pulpit that morning and he fumbled his way. I should point out that, in, that, in, that it, as well as the 12 members, on the back row, there was a 13-year-old boy who wasn't a part of the church. And John Eglin, for 10 minutes, fumbled his way through this sermon. You know, he, his, his mind wandered. He, he did. And at the end of, of 10 minutes... He fixed his eyes and his gaze on the 13-year-old boy. And he said, look to Jesus, son. Look to Jesus, son. Look to Jesus. And that 13-year-old boy, that 13-year-old boy, when he became a man, would say that particular Sunday, he wrote it in his book, that particular Sunday, when that man looked at me and said, look unto Jesus, son. He wrote in his book, the light came in, wow. the dawn came, the cloud of darkness left me, and I knew that Jesus, the Son of God, had touched me. Wow. And as a man, he wrote in his book those words, the man, the 13-year-old boy, his name, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I doubt, I doubt if ever John Eglin knew what he'd done that morning. But because he decided to stand up and go to his church and walk six miles, he made a difference. Friend, you're a difference maker. You're a difference maker. You're a difference maker. Because the difference maker lives in your heart. Hey, we doing all right? Hey, I want to give you... I want to give you maybe six, seven things, and I'll go quick. Qualities of difference makers. My first quality here of a difference maker is this. Is that difference makers believe passionately about the call of God. I, before I get to that one, can I just tell you another story? I'll finish on time, Rob, honest. 
Do you know, I was, I, was, I was laying in bed this morning, I was thinking about this sermon, and I thought, my, for some reason, my mind went to another difference maker. I want to take you for a moment to a village in the central belt of Scotland called Kirkmuir Hill. I want to take you to the house of a widow. Her name's Jenny. She was her mum. And every Sunday morning and every Sunday night, Jenny, the widow, would take her two boys. I was four. Rob would have been five or six. And every Sunday morning night, she'd take us to the, the Brethren Gospel Hall. And every Sunday morning, Rob and I, the brats, would go into the Sunday school. And we'd annoy the Sunday school teacher. I think I was brat one, brat two. <laughs> and, but somewhere that lady, that Sunday school teacher made a difference. Because I remember her stories about Noah. I remember her stories about Jesus. I remember her stories about Adam, about Eve. I remember her stories in the Bible. And you know, I doubt if she ever knew that she made a difference. I think one of the, one of the most amazing days of her life when she heard the news that the brats were emigrating to Australia. <laughs> and over the years, over the years since I've been in Scotland, I've pondered this a lot. I've wondered if I should just get on the phone and ring the minister at the Gospel Hall Assembly in the village of Kirtmuir Hill and say, I want to tell you something. I've still got the Bible you presented me in 1972. I want to tell you something. That the brat class of the late 60s and early 70s made good. They've made a difference. Brat too has been to the Ukraine hundreds of times with his wife. Preached, teached all over and made a difference. Brat one, goodness me, preached in 35 nations. Done youth conferences all over Europe, South Africa, India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Algeria. Preached everywhere. Why? Because of me? No. Goodness me, my education didn't have one. <laughs> Sat my high school exam, doped to the eyeballs, and then wondered why I failed. <laughs> Come on, the difference maker's here. His name's Jesus Christ. We need to believe passionately about the call of God. Listen, the Apostle Paul, or Saul, the persecutor of the church, he's riding along the Damascus Road. He's made widows. He's made orphans out of Christian people. He's consented to the death of Stephen. He's on his horse going down the Damascus Road. A, a shining bright light, brighter than the sun. He gets knocked off his horse, and a voice comes to his ears from heaven. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Paul, Saul, responds with two questions. And those two questions set the course of the rest of his life. The two questions, who are you, Lord, and what do you want me to do? And would to God every born-again believer would ask those two same questions. Who are you, Lord, and what do you want me to do? God wants you to do something. He wants you to get in touch with the difference maker and go make a difference in your marriage, your home, your church, your community, wherever you go. You've got the difference maker on the inside of you. But you've got to believe passionately about the call of God, man. You, you, you can't just entertain it as a good thought. You've got to look at it as there's no other option, but I've got to answer the call of Jesus. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Point two, we need to believe accurately about ourselves if we're going to make a difference. In John's gospel, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the re religious leaders, they sent a contingent to John the Baptist. And if you look what they said, they actually said, who are you and what do you say about yourself? How you answer those questions will determine whether you make a difference. John the Baptist, when he heard those questions, he could, could have said a lot of things. But he answered them straight out of the scriptures. He said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the paths of the Lord. And you know what? Sometimes that demonic spirit world gets around us and asks us some questions. Who are you and what do you say about yourself? We're either going to say, I'm a no-hoper, I'm a loser, I'm this, I'm that. 
You know, the world's very good at putting wrong labels on us. We've got to answer straight out of scripture. This is who I am. I'm a difference maker. I'm a son of God. I'm a child of God. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. So we've got to believe accurately about ourselves. Do you know, Jesus said this about his people. He said, you're difference makers, but this is how he said it. You're the salt of the earth and you're the light of the world. Salt makes a difference. It stops corruption. Light makes a difference. It dispels the darkness. We're difference makers. Do you believe it? Got to believe it. And then my point three here is this. Difference makers live the crucified life. Difference makers live the crucified life. In other words, they live with kingdom values. They live with a kingdom mindset. They go the extra mile. Difference makers get rid of the ugly attitudes of life and they embrace the beautiful attitudes of life. The beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are those when persecuted man that they respond with the spirit of Jesus Christ. Do you know, we need, a, we need a mindset that, hey, we're going to go the extra mile. We're going to go the extra mile in our families. We're going to go the extra mile in our churches. We're going to go the extra mile in the factory, the office. We're going to go the extra mile at the checkout. You know, a while ago, there was a, a, a lady. I was standing next to a lady at the checkout with her son. And um, the boy had something. There was something there that he wanted pack of sweeties or something and I heard the mum say we don't have the money for that and I said to the lady excuse me I'll buy them she looked her jaw dropped so why would you want to do that and I just said because I can (laughs) (laughs) difference makers difference makers do you know I think I brought too many notes anyway it doesn't matter Hey, can we take a can we take a break here? And um, I'll just I'll just, I'll be really upset. I'll go home depressed if I don't read this one. Listen to this. <laughs> when I read this paragraph to you, right, I want you to keep thinking in your brain all the way through it. I want you to notice that these people I mentioned are all individuals. I sought for a man. I sought for a man. In 1858, a Boston Sunday school teacher named Kimball began visiting one of his students at the shoe shop where he worked as a clerk. Eventually, Kimball led him to Christ. The student's name was D.L. Moody. 21 years later, Moody, now an evangelist, visited London and a great spiritual awakening took place. F.B. Meyer, a local pastor in London, went to hear Moody and his life was transformed. Later, Mayer went to America to preach, and in one of his meetings, a student named J. Wilbur Chapman got saved. Chapman became active in the YMCA, where he met and disciplined a former baseball player called Billy Sunday. And Billy Sunday became a great revivalist, and in one of his crusades in Charlotte, a businessman came to Christ. And a year later, they decided that their city needed another crusade. So they invited Mordecai Ham to be their speaker. After three weeks, Mordecai Ham left town disheartened, discouraged, because after three weeks, he'd only had one convert. The convert, a 12-year-old boy called Billy Graham. (laughs) Responsible for leading millions of people all over this planet to Jesus Christ. My fourth point here about becoming a difference maker is we need a positive mindset. We need a positive mindset. I've often been amazed at the story. This this was the Sunday school, school teacher again. Man, she used to paint a good picture about David and Goliath. Thought about it so often that a 17-year-old boy came out and saw a giant and had no fear. 
a king called Saul, who was head and shoulders above everyone else, came out and looked at the giant and said, he's too big to fight. But David said, no, he's too big to miss. How is our mindset today? Yeah. Our mind set. You see, Paul's argument to the Colossian believers was this in chapter 3. If then you be risen with Christ, set your mind on things above. Yeah. 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 If we've got a new pers- position, we need a new perspective. Yeah. 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 Do you know, listen to this, right? You and me... You are the air traffic controller of your own mental airport. These thoughts fly around us and they radio in the ugly thoughts. You're a loser, man. You're a has been. No one would love you. I used to have that thought all the time, man. It tormented me. You'll never get married. You're, you're ugly, man. Yeah, that's why I went, well, thanks for that. <laughs> but these thoughts buzz around their head. And they go, this, that, permission to land, permission denied. Oh. And then the good thoughts come around their head. You're a son of God. You're a difference maker. You've got a future and a hope and a final outcome. Yeah. Permission to land, granted. Whoa. Paul... The apostle said it another way. Paul said this. He said, casting down imaginations and every high thing, thought that would exalt itself above the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought and make it obey Christ. Man, your thoughts, they're either taking you forward or they're, they're limiting you. Your thoughts will either make you go forward in Christ or they'll sabotage your potential in Christ. You know, Paul said, put off the old man. And then I'll skip a verse. And then he said, put on the new man. But the middle verse to those two is this. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. He said it to the Roman Christians another way. He said, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you might prove in your experience the good and the perfect will of God. I want to highlight today the direct correlation between the renewal of your mind and you proving in your experience, your life experience, the will of God for your life. And the will of God for your life and my life is that we make a difference with the time that we have been allotted. I asked for water and I think I need some. Do you know, I just want to back up a Because, again, I wrote it in my notes. And see, when I don't speak about stuff that's in my notes, I go home and I just, oh, man. Anyway, going back to John the Baptist. What are you, who are you? What do you say about yourself? See, I discovered this two weeks ago. See, in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 9, you'll read this. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is a, a little discovery I made. See the phrase, there was a man? It is summed up in the Greek language in one word, eganito. And eganito literally means there appeared on the stage of history. There appeared on the stage of history a man sent from God whose name was John. I'll say it one more time, but I want you thinking about your name. There appeared on the stage of history, Rob Smiley. Julie Smiley. There appeared on the stage of history the man with the birthday over there. There appeared on the stage of history this man, this lady, this man. Friend, on the 23rd of April, 2023, by the will of God, you and I in Eastbourne have appeared on the stage of history. How will our life pan out? Will we become difference makers? Will we stand before Almighty God? Will we have 
precious stones and gold and silver in terms of our accomplishments and achievements for Jesus? Will we have those? Or as Paul said, there'll be some that'll stand on that day and all they'll have is wood, hay and stubble. Friend, I can't think of any greater cause. I can't think of any greater person in all of history to serve than the Son of God who was crucified on a cross for the sins of this world. I cannot think of anyone else I would rather serve that when I am at my ugliest, he's at his best. I can't think of a God, we, like we sang it, a God that is relentless in his pursuit of your soul. He's relentless in the pursuit of men and women that are outside the church, that, that are away from God. He was relentless in his pursuit of brat two and brat one. And because of his unfailing, undying, and relentless love, he captured us with the love of God, with the message of the gospel. And he said, Jenny Smiley, I'm going to show you a miracle. I'm going to take your two boys, and I'm going to make them difference makers. I'm going to give them a fantastic wife each. Wife of brat one, wife of brat two. I mean, my wife, Rachel, goodness me, I'm not going to tell, you think I was bad. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking, Rachel. <laughs> I love you so deeply, honey. But they're appeared on the stage of history. Hey, we've got two more to go, right? We'll land it here, right, in a minute. Number five, if we're going to be difference makers, we need faith and vision. We need to cultivate faith. We need to cultivate, stir vision. Do you know what? In 1993, 1992, I drove home from the factory where I worked in Melbourne. And I felt God just whisper into my heart, go, to the, go and get a map. Go and buy a map of Scotland. And I went and I bought a map of Scotland and I blue tacked it onto my bedroom wall. It was there a year. And I'd pray over it most days. And I'd pray, Jesus, where do you want me to go? I got a vision for a town somewhere that I don't know of yet in Scotland. And one day I looked at the bottom of the map. And I forget what they call all the explanations of the symbols and that on a map. The key. The key. And on the key to the map, it had a green dot for, it, for towns. And the example they gave was green dot, air principal root destination what i thought oh that's a word from god you might think you're weird man but i took that as, and we went to air in 1993 with a vision man we rented a community center we didn't know a soul we didn't know anyone man and we rented it july the 31st 1993 we 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 were there i had an amplifier about that big and we did our best and we, have it a, we had a go. And the difference maker showed up and two people accepted Christ. <laughs> and 30, that was because of vision, vision, vision. And then 30 years later, this year, July the 31st, we've been there 30 years. Has it been easy? Goodness me. There's been times the difference maker Jesus has found me bleeding and dying on the Jericho Road. But he's poured in the oil and the wine and he's put stuffing on the inside again. And he said, come on, get back up again and sharpen your faith and believe again. We used to have a saying in a church, if they could get past the smelly toilets at the front of the building, they'd become members. And one day a young couple, a young couple called Owen and Kate Morris walked in to the church. And man, I was preaching away, man. I was just preaching away. And um, they seemed to enjoy it. Owen didn't say much. And they left. And over lunch that Sunday morning, Rachel said to me, do you think we'll see the young couple again? They were about 22 years of age. And I said, nah, I don't think we'll ever see them again. Next Sunday, they were there again. And I asked Owen once, I said, what brought you back the second time? And this is what he said to me. He said it was the passion. He said it was the power of the vision. You stood in that pulpit and you actually believed that you were sent from God to make a difference. Here's another story. I want to tell you the story. 1954, 
two friends, very close friends, Walt and Art. And one day Walt rang up Art, his friend in Los Angeles, and said, Art, this coming Saturday I'd like to pick you up and take you for a drive in the countryside. And Art agreed, and so they got in Walt's car and they drove miles outside, outside the outer suburbs of Los Angeles. And they got out of the car, and all the land for acre upon acre upon acre was virgin land. There was a few farms here and there, but the bulk of the land was just, as far as your eye could see, it was untouched virgin land. And Walt said to his friend, Art, I've bought up some acres here. And I'm going to build something here. And when I build it, people are going to want the surrounding land. And I want to give you, my friend Art, the first opportunity to buy up the surrounding land. And Art linked letter said, Walt, I just can't see it. I can't see it. And Walt, Walt Disney, built his dream. And within a few years, all the land that he'd offered his friend Art had been purchased. Shops sprang up, motels sprang up, housing areas sprang up, schools sprang up, churches sprang up. Art could have made a fortune, but he couldn't see. Both men stood and saw the same barren land. One saw it with vision, one saw it with faith. One saw it with a dream, the other couldn't see beyond these natural eyes. Friend, can I ask you to be a difference maker? What do you see today? What do you see today? Do you know, life is tough, man. Sometimes, see the last two and a half years since we lost our daughter, goodness me, there's been times where I've just simply wanted to say to whoever, I guess, God, do you know, God, It's too much. It's too much. But you know, Jesus, I'm not there yet. I don't think he'll ever get there. I said that to Ashley yesterday. He agreed with me. But you know what? I I just don't want to quit. I will never quit. I'll never quit. There's nothing in me wants to quit. I feel like I do sometimes, but in my heart of hearts, the difference maker says, come on. I'm still the one that gives power to the faint. I'm still the one that to those that have no might, I increase strength. I'm still the one that tells you, John, that if you'll wait on me, I'll cause you to mount up with wings like an eagle. I'm still the one that has declared to you, I am the apostle and the high priest of your confession. Your proclamation. John, what are you proclaiming? What are you proclaiming? How are you sharpening your faith today? Vision. Faith. Ingredients in becoming a difference maker. And I'll, I'll, I'll wind up with this one. Difference makers. They overcome the past. Difference makers overcome the past. Some people remain controlled by the past and make excuses. Other people rise above the past and make a difference. Moses the murderer rises above his past and makes a difference. David the adulterer rises above his past and makes a difference. Peter the denier rises above his past and makes a difference. Thomas the doubter rises above his past and makes a difference. Paul, the persecutor, rises above his past and makes a difference. Friend, what's your name? What do you have to rise above the past with by the grace of God and make a difference? Because I'll tell you, you can do it. The cross cancels my excuse book out. Man, some of the things, I'm I'm not saying this to, you, you know, some of the things that I used to do with Julie's brother and the other four misfits that were our friends. I still to this day, every time I think about it, shudder with a sense of shame and 
that we, Dave and I, we used to grow marijuana plants in the local primary school. That is sick, man. Sick. But hey, Jesus came for sickos. Hey, just a qu- can I paint a word picture for you? Difference makers overcome the past. Difference makers overcome the past. Do you know, in 37 years of preaching, I've met them, the Christians, physically well, emotionally well, financially reasonably good. But in their heart, they've retreated and they've checked in to the retirement home of regret. And they rock back and forth on the chair called If Only. And about four o'clock in the afternoon, they all meet in the common room of the retirement home of regret. And they stand, and in unison, they sing the song, if only. If only. And if you lean in closer, you'll hear, if only I'd been born somewhere else. If only... I'd received the counsel of the pastor. If only I'd offered a sincere apology. If only I hadn't done this or I had done that. And then they leave the common room and they go back to the rocking chair and they rock back and forth. It could have been. It could have been. Friend, We are so much better than that. We're so much better. Because the difference maker, Jesus, lives in our heart. We are called by God to make a difference. Romans 1 verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of the Son of God. Friend, that's you, that's me. We might not be called to be an apostle, but I'll tell you, we're called to be a difference maker. Amen? Amen. 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 Do you know, I just want to finish with giving an invitation to respond to the gospel. You might say, John, why should I respond to the gospel? Well, you don't have to. But can I say it would make very, very good sense to respond to the gospel. Three reasons we need Jesus in our life, the difference maker. First reason, we've all got a past. Jesus has a way of coming into our life and goes down the corridors of our past and he blots and he cancels out and he wipes away every sin because that's why he hung on a cross. Jesus loves us so much that he went all the way. The sinless one, the perfect one, the son of God. I'll go to the cross and I'll pay the price by shedding my blood to wash people from all nations, from all tribes, from all places. I'll wash their sin away if they will only repent. We've all got a past. And you know, if we're all honest with our past, if we're all honest with our conscience, we know we've done wrong. Do you know, when I was 15 years old on the way to the high school dance with David, Julie's brother, we went into a shop. And you know what I did? I stole a packet of Tic Tacs. Did I have a good evening? No. Because my conscience convicted me that I'd stolen something. See, if we're honest, come on, if we're honest, we know we've done wrong. We've got a past. That's why we need forgiveness. Number two, we've got a present. Come on, who else are we going to trust? The politicians? Man, I don't doubt they're trying to do a good job. But they're not going to fix the present. Jesus is a very present help. 
Jesus can walk into your life today and make a difference. And the third reason we need Jesus is, come on, we've got a future. We've got a destination we're going to. Do you know, Jesus Christ was tolerant of many things. He was tolerant of the disciples' failure. He was tolerant of people's sins. He was tolerant of the disciples' and the apostles' mistakes. But there's one thing Jesus, the Son of God, was not tolerant of, and that was the thought that there are many ways to God. He stood in the front of the multitudes one day and he said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. One way to God. So I'll just finish and cast this out there. If you're here today and you would like to receive Jesus Christ, the difference maker, into your heart, I would love you to see someone in this church. Who could they see, Rob? Just give me the person who's... Mel or Karen. Stand up, Mel and Karen. Mel and Karen. There they, just keep standing, Mel and Karen. If you're here today and you'd like to know more about Jesus the difference maker, please see Mel or Karen and they will give you a copy of this book and they can pray for you. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Let me just finish and pray. <laughs> Father God, we thank you today for the examples of history of the difference makers. We thank you, Father God, for the ultimate difference maker, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Thank you for the difference, Jesus, that you've made in most of the lives here this morning. And Jesus, with fresh purpose, with fresh inspiration, with fresh determination, we want to serve you, go out into our world, and make a difference for the kingdom of God. I pray, Father God, that your spirit would, over the course of this week, remind us of one or two or three of the things that we've heard this morning. And that with fresh courage, we would rise up and we would press towards the mark for the prize of the upward call of Christ. Father, I ask it in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thanks, Rob. Wow.